God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. That's the definition of God we're looking at for this sermon series of the first Sunday of the month. We are looking at what's called the attributes of God, something that is true about God, that's what the word attribute means. And that definition of God is from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question four, which is, what is God? And that's the title of this sermon series, What is God? And today we're going to look at God is holy, or to quote the catechism, to paraphrase it rather, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his holiness. So we're going to look at what I would say is the most famous passage in the Bible on the holiness of God. Um, it's Isaiah chapter 6. Every book I've read on the holiness of God mentions this passage. Um, every chapter on the holiness of God in a book mentions this passage. Every sermon mentions this passage. So I'm going to be in very good company. We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Let's hear God's word. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken the tongues from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? Then I said, Here am I, send me. That's God's word. Let's pray. O oh God, almighty, infinite, powerful, great, kind, merciful, and gracious, and holy, holy, holy. We bear before you and come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would open our minds and our hearts and our wills to this truth that you are holy, that we would be changed, that we would take seriously this truth about you and what you expect of us, and that we would all live holy lives to your glory. Bless this talk now, bless it to our, us all and to me. And may we all gaze on your glory and be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. So God is holy. And we're going to look at three points. Every attribute of God we've asked these questions of in this series. The holiness of God. What is it? That's point one. Some examples of it. Point two and some applications, point three. Um, point one, what is it? Point two, what do we see? How do we see in the examples that God is holy? And point three, what difference should that make to our life? God is holy, point one, what is it? The holiness of God is something that is true about God. Holiness has two principal meanings in the Bible. Um, 
One is set apart. Two is moral purity. So when we say something is set apart, we mean it is set apart for a holy use. Uh, the actual word is cut. It's separate. The first time the word is used is in Genesis 2 where God blesses the Sabbath and makes it holy and there's several ways of saying holy in the Bible you can we'll get through them all I think um, as the talk goes on there's being holy being sanctified being set apart being consecrated but they all mean the same thing when God blessed the seventh day at creation all the days belonged to God but God said that one day is set apart for his holy use, it's holy, it's set apart for me. That was God's day from creation to the first Easter weekend. Um, the holy table, uh, the altar in the temple, and the communion table is called the Lord's table or the holy table. It means it's set apart for God. All the tables belong to God because everything in the world belongs to God. But that one, for that purpose, is a holy purpose. So it especially belongs to the Lord. So how does this relate to God? Well, when we say God is holy, we're meaning two things. We're meaning he is set apart and that he is morally pure. He is set apart. He is different to us. Indeed, C.S. Lewis said, described God as the holy other. He is unique. Human, every human being is unique, but we're part of a species there's billions of us on the planet, but there's only one of God. And there's only one. God is utterly unique. And God, in his holiness, that is utterly unique. That's why, you know, when it talks about only God is holy, the first and last songs in the Bible, um, Exodus um, 15 and the one in Revelation, I can't remember the chapter just now, but it they say God alone is holy. What we mean when we say that is God alone is holy in and of himself. His holiness is unique. He is completely separate from his creation. He's not under the same laws of the laws of nature. He is set apart. A really good way of saying this is found in verse 1. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The holiness of God means he's set apart and it is an exalted majesty. That's what the holiness of God means, an exalted majesty. When a king in the ancient world sat on a throne, it meant he was higher than you. And kings and queens wore a long robe. Indeed, when the queen was crowned in 1953, she wore a long robe. It was a sign of her majesty her royal dignity and authority. But all the kings of the world and all the rulers of the world are nothing compared to the majesty of God. His robe filled the temple. The bigger your robe, the more dignity and authority you had. God's robe fills the temple. Such is his exalted majesty, his dignity and his authority. God is holy. He's set apart. He's separate from his creation. Even though his creation depends on him, moment by moment, he is separate from it. He is set apart. He's independent of it. And he's an exalted majesty. That's the first way of saying God is holy. It's the one that's not talked about as much. But that's actually, over and over again, what's emphasized in the Bible. When we say God is holy, it means, the phrase I've used, exalted majesty, as we see here. The second point is God's holiness means moral purity. Moral purity. God is without sin. And it's not just negative. It's not just that God is without sin. It's that God loves holiness 
and hates wickedness. He loves righteousness and hates iniquity. He loves what is right and hates what is wrong. So it's not just about what God doesn't do, it's about what he does. It's not about what God isn't, it's about what God is. He's pure, he's holy, he's untainted with sin. And Habakkuk 1.13 puts it like this, he's too pure to look at iniquity. He can't have fellowship with it. He's set apart from it. That's how the two points of God's holiness overlap. That God is morally pure, so he separates from sin and evil and impurity. He can do nothing else because a holy God cannot have fellowship, cannot come to terms with, cannot be at peace with sin and wrong and iniquity, which means disregard for God's law. God is holy and that is why he withdraws from us. That's why we need a saviour. That's why we need Jesus to rescue us, because God is holy. He is high and exalted above us, and he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Now, I want to dwell on this a little bit more. Why is this important? It's important because... The Bible emphasizes the holiness of God. Indeed, many Bible scholars say God is called the Holy One more than any other title, any other attribute. And indeed, there's something about God that's emphasized in this passage. When you and I want to emphasize something, if we leave a note, we might draw it in underline. Uh, we might, excuse me, we might underline it. We might write it in capital letters. Um, but in the ancient world, the world of the Bible, it, to, re, to emphasize something, you repeated it. You know, the more you repeated it, the more important it was. The only attribute of God that's repeated three times is the holiness of God. And it's repeated twice, once in Isaiah 6 and once in Revelation 5. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. R.C. Sproul, in his classic on the holiness of God, says, God is not called merciful, merciful, merciful. He's not called gracious, gracious, gracious. Love, love, love. He is called holy, holy, holy. And everything about God is holy, and everything that God does is holy. His love is a holy love. His mercy is a holy mercy. His anger is a holy anger. His justice is a holy justice. He is exalted, high, and he is, as Jonathan Edwards says, he is as high above a, an archangel as he is above a worm. He's exalted high, he's morally pure, and that's what we mean when God is holy, when we say God is holy. And it's emphasized to such a degree in the Bible that it's the title God has the most. So when we say God is holy, that's what we mean. And again, to quote the Catechism again, God is a spirit infinitely, eternally and unchangeably holy. Let these truths sink in to our minds and our hearts. Examples. Point two, examples. What examples do we find in scripture that show us that God is holy? Well, there's two ways that we've been looking at each attribute. And one is creation, the other is redemption. Creation, how God has made us. Redemption, how God rescues us. As I said last week, God's law is given to every human being in creation. Um, we call it conscience. Romans 2 says God written, God's written his law on everybody's heart. Um, and we read in Genesis 1 that God made humanity in his image. And one of, the, one, of the th one of the things it means that we're made in the image of God is that we have a moral awareness and a moral compass. 
Yes, even despite the fall, we have traces of God's law on our hearts. God's law is given at creation. It's also given in the scriptures in both the Old and the New Testament. We've used this um, saying before, the form is different, but the substance is the same. So um, under the Old Testament, Israel was governed by the law of Moses. In the New Testament, it's the law of Christ. The law of Moses passes away and we live in the new covenant now, which we call the law of Christ. And there are some that are different. Some laws are different. Some laws are the same. And what is the same is what we call God's law. It's just the, exp the, the law itself is the same, but the expression of it is different. For example, God will be worshipped how he wants to be worshipped. That's the same in both the Old and the New Testament. However, the expression of it is different. God has a day, as we've mentioned. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That was his day up until the first Easter weekend after the resurrection of Jesus. His day was the first day of the week, Sunday. Um, so there's, what is the same is that God has one day among the seven that is his. What is different is the expression of it. All of God's law is like that. But what it shows us is that God is holy and that as it's his law, he must punish sin. The law of God, summarized in the Ten Commandments or in the teachings of Jesus, is found, traces of it are found in all societies, in all nations, uh, all over the world. We all worship something. We all value work and rest. We all value marriage. Um, murder is a crime in all parts of the world. We um, all have a sense of adultery and theft and property rights and all that. We see the, all this because God has put his law in our hearts. Indeed, the New Testament shows the fullness of this. We see it in the life, death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He fulfilled the law. He is the perfect fulfillment of every command of God, both what we call the law of God in nature and the law that was given to Israel, the law of Moses, which contained the law of God. Jesus is the perfect example of holiness, the perfect representation of God and all that's right, good and beautiful. He and he alone is that. So Jesus shows us the holiness of God as expressed through the law. We also see the holiness of God in how God saves us in redemption. We see it in the gospel. Yes, Jesus fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the law in order to be our saviour. Yes, so it's not just law, it's gospel that Jesus lived the perfect life, because we all owe God two debts. Um, punishment for sin, we owe God payment for what we've done wrong, and obedience. God still expects obedience of us. Jesus lived the perfect life that we should have lived and died the death that we deserve to die. So our debt is paid for by God. And this is the gospel that we, if you're in Christ, he has forgiven all your sins because he died for them. If you're in Christ, you stand perfectly righteous before God because you stand in the righteousness of Jesus. You stand clean, forgiven, pure, spotless, and no one can lay a charge against you because Jesus lived, died, and rose again and pleads for you now at the right hand of God. But we also see Salvation isn't just about forgiving us or making us right with God. It's about making us holy. We call it sanctification. And sanctification, to quote the Catechism again, sanctification is an act of God's free grace by which our whole person is made new in the image of God and we are made more and more able to become dead to sin and alive to righteousness. 
So we become more and more, as the longer we're Christians, we become dead to sin and alive to righteousness. We stop doing what's wrong and we do what's right. That's how God shows his holiness. He makes us holy. Indeed, this is the work of the Trinity. God commands us, be holy for I am holy. Jesus died to make us holy because when he died, our old self died with him. When he was raised, we were raised with him. We're united to him by faith. He's exalted on high. We're seated with him in heavenly places. And his life of obedience is the pattern for us. So he was born of the Spirit in the Virgin Mary. We're born again by the Holy Spirit. He lived a life of obedience. So we, the Spirit that lived in him, lives in us to conform us more to his image, to be more like Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is the Spirit that unites us to him and gives us the power to live the holy life, to put to death the deeds of the body. It's the Trinity in action, making us holy that Christ is the one we are, will be conformed into the image of. That's what it means. It means we'll become like Jesus. The Holy Spirit does that in us, causes us to be born again, and causes us to live the Christian life and to grow in grace. That's how we see God's holiness. We see it in his law, and we see it in the gospel. It's all revealed in scripture. We see God who is holy. We see that God, after his law had been broken, couldn't just say, oh, it's all right, don't worry about it. He sent his son to die. Nothing shows us the holiness of God more than the cross. That God was so uncompromising with sin that he would not have it any other way. His law had to be obeyed and the price had to be paid. And God the Son went willingly to the cross for our sins so we could be holy, blameless and above reproach in the sight of God. That's how we see the holiness of God in creation and in redemption. Point three, applications. What difference does this make to our lives? Well, Isaiah, as we've read a few minutes ago, saw the holiness of God. He saw God exalted in his exalted majesty, in his moral purity, and he fell down and said, Woe is me, for I am lost. He saw he could not live up to God's standard, and he saw that he needed to be rescued, he needed to be saved. Now we know that because we have the fullness of God's word, that we need to be rescued by the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to see God in his holiness and ourselves in our sinfulness and cry out to the Lord Jesus to save us. We need to turn from our sins with grief and sorrow, hating them and resolving in true obedience and we need to receive Christ as he's offered in the gospel. The gospel is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You'll be forgiven all your sins, you'll be accepted into God's family, and you'll be given a new heart to walk in the ways of Christ. This is what we have to do to be saved. This is what we must do, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So come to Jesus Christ this very day, God is holy and he cannot have fellowship with sin. So please come to Jesus Christ this very day. A second point, a second application is we should be humble. Look at the seraphs. We don't know who they are. Um, they're heavenly creatures. But look how they, and these creatures have no sin. Above God stood two seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. They, they, these sinless creatures covered their face before God, because God was too holy for them to look at. 
They cover their feet. It's a sign of humility that you don't show those things to God. There's a lot of explanations why they covered the, the feet, but we don't know why. I, I'm not convinced by any of them, other than they are an expression of humility. And with two they flew. And in this expression of humility, covered face and covered feet, they just cry out, holy, 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 from a humble heart. And these creatures had no sin. But seeing the majesty of God, the holiness of God, the glory of God, they have to cover themselves. We too should be humble. Indeed, Matthew Poole's commentary that I quoted a few months back on Psalm 90 said, Knowledge of God is the, and humility are the foundation of all piety. So holy living, that's what piety means, is a knowledge of God and a knowledge of ourselves. So we should be humble before God. And by humble, it doesn't mean going around saying how horrible we are. That can be pride, actually. But humble basically says we, every good gift we have is from God and everything bad is from ourselves. So we should thank God and say sorry to God. Thank God for all the good things he's given to us and confess to God all the things we've done wrong. Say sorry to him. So humility. Third application is, and this will take a bit of explaining, we should fear God. Now by fear, it doesn't mean like you're walking down a street in a dark night and you hear footsteps behind you. That can be cause fear. But it's not primarily or mainly what that means when we say fear God. It means a holy, humble reverence, admiration, love and obedience for God in our hearts. Um, it's a big topic. One of my favourite books actually is The Joy of Fearing God by Jerry Bridges. Um, it, it profoundly moved me actually in a book in a way no book has or very rarely has had. I read it in 2009 and it is magnificent. Um, but we should fear God. We should, when we come to worship him next week, let's come in the fear of the Lord. When we talk about God, let's do it in the fear of God, knowing how holy he is. Um, when we sing songs, when we pray, when we read the Bible, let's have a holy reverence for God, wherever, whatever we're doing. A holy reverence for a holy God. And let it guide all that we think, say and do. The fourth application should be to pray, hallowed be your name. The Lord Jesus, when he taught us the Lord Prayer, made that the first thing we should ask God for. Do you ask God that he would hallowed, that he's, we would keep his own name holy? That's the first priority Jesus taught us in the prayer. The holiness and the glory of God's name should be the first thing in our lives, in our prayers, in our thinking, in our doing. But yet in our prayers, the first thing Jesus taught us to ask for is that God's name would be kept holy. It's the positive, it's the way of positively saying what the third commandment says. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You know, use his name properly with reverence, with holiness, with respect. When you pray, think about what you're praying. Don't just use God's name as a filler like you. Unfortunately, you hear it. Some people say it. They're praying and they go, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you'd be with us now, Lord, and that you'd bless what we're doing now, Lord. Don't use God's name like that as a way of, Filling your time in prayer, don't do that. And don't plead, oh well, God's my friend. You don't talk to your friend like that. Have reverence, have a holy stillness before God. John Bunyan said it's better to pray without words than use words without praying. You know, think about what you're saying. 
have a reverence in your mind and in your heart for God's name and honour and glory. And finally, seek to grow in holiness. Um, we talked about sanctification, how God makes us holy. It, it's used in two senses. We are completely holy in Christ. And we are made more and more holy the longer we, become, we are Christians. So one is fixed and one grows or decreases, as we all know, as the case may be. Grow in holiness. Make no peace with sin. Make no peace with sin. We say, I just asked, is, is God, the glory of God's name, your passion in prayer? Does the glory of God's name govern how you live your life. You know, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who calls you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. In what you think, in what you say, in what you do, be holy in every part of your life. Do all things to God's glory. So how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, you know what I'm going to say. God's given us many helps to help us to grow in holiness. We call them uh, private habits and public habits. The usual way of saying them are disciplines, the Christian disciplines. But one book calls them habits, Christian habits. And there's private habits, habits that you form by yourself, and public habits, habits that you do with other people. Private habits or disciplines, Bible reading and prayer. Please be reading the Bible. Read all of it and read all of it in an orderly way. Read the passages that we're looking at on Sundays over and over again. Read them every day. Imagine how well you'd know the passages if you did that. How, how prepared you'd be to hear from God in the service. So read the Bible. Hear the Bible, read and preached. Um, sing the Bible, pray the Bible, and see the Bible. Get texts, and when we gather at some point in the future, baptism and the Lord's Supper, but one thing at a time. So we, you get the Bible into you and start praying. You know, ask God to make you holy. Meditate on the truths about God in his word that you learn. And ask, what should I believe and what should I do? And then ask God to help you put it into practice. They're the private disciplines, prayer, meditation, and Bible reading. The public ways of helping us be holy are church, which we'll be meeting next week. So please come to church, hear what we do in private, we do in public, but we do it with everybody else. Hear the word of God preached, um, come to a life group, come to a Bible study, come to church, chat, get involved. Get with other Christians, this is how we do it. He that walks with the wise becomes wise. Hear the word preach and get into all these things. And then asking God to use them to make you holy. That's how we grow in holiness. But we have to do it all with our eyes on Jesus Christ. Because without him we can do nothing. Without him all of that would just be a list of do's and don'ts. Holiness is about intimacy with God through Jesus Christ. It's being made like Jesus by the power of the Spirit to the glory of God. That's what the holiness of God means to our life, that we have the privilege of being made holy like Jesus. And so at the last, we'll share in his glory. And the final application, which follows on from this, 
Think about heaven. Think about heaven. Heaven is a holy place. No more sin, no more sadness, no more sickness. One of the Puritans, Richard Baxter, disciplined himself to think about heaven for half an hour every night. He saw his whole town changed in his ministry in Kidderminster. He saw hundreds come to Christ. He was so spiritually minded, he was very useful worldly. Because he was spiritually minded and heavenly minded in the genuine sense. Get heaven. If you want to read a passage about heaven, read Revelation 4 and 5 and see what heaven is like. It's all of God. It's all of Christ forever and ever. It's all of them. And we'll cry, worthy is the lamb that was slain. And we'll see his face and his name will be on our forehead and all will be holiness and glorious to the glory of God. Bless you.